Hi, this is John Vandermosten, Senior Biotech Analyst at Zach Small Cap Research. Today we're going to discuss a new cancer immunotherapy with an emerging biotech company called CellSci, ticker symbol CVM. CellSci has two platforms, Multikine and Leaps. Multikine is involved in clinical trials for head and neck cancer and HPV, while Leaps is focused on rheumatoid arthritis, pandemic flu, and breast cancer. The company's CEO, Geert Kirsten, uh, is with us here today to share his thoughts on the company and its lead candidate, Multikine. Geert has been with uh, CellSci since 1987 and has been leading the company since the early 1990s. He started his career working in law and investment banking after graduating with an MBA from George Washington University and a law degree from American University. Geert, welcome to CEO Money. How are you today? Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, by the way. Oh, you're welcome. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so let us start with, out with some questions. Uh, Multikine is an immunotherapy, uh, but it has a different way of working compared to some of the uh, more familiar cancer drugs uh, that we've heard of, like checkpoint inhibitors or CAR-T. How can you explain what it does and how it works? Okay, I'll keep it simple. First of all, we're one of the first companies in the world to have started with cancer immunotherapy. So for 20 years, we were out there pretty much alone. And only five, six years ago did that whole concept catch up. Now 50% of all cancer studies are in cancer immunotherapy. Yet, they all are, except including the checkpoint inhibitors, being given to patients whose immune system has already been destroyed by surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Or it's metastatic cancer. In all cases, essentially, you cannot save these patients. Uh, so you hope to give them more time. We, on the other hand, say, well, if the immune system keeps us alive, there ought to be a way to actually cure a patient. So we're going into patients who have just been diagnosed at a time when the immune system is still healthy, and we combine it with surgery, radiation, chemo to give you a better chance of never dying from that cancer. Okay. And uh, your lead indication is squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck and it's for treatment in naive patients. And why are you targeting multikine towards this setting? Well, it's a horrible disease. It's about 600,000 people from under your nose down to your clavicle. So among tongue cancer, they cut the tongue out. It's just, oh, it's a miserable disease. Um, as a rule, for the patients we're treating, every other one will be dead three years after diagnosis. It's miserable. The last approval from FDA was 60 years ago, methotrexate. I, we have orphan drug designation. We need to do better. So we're giving, if surgery, radiation, chemo can only achieve, call it a 50% cure rate, then we need to make that better. And we're saying the immune system has the power to make that better, but only if you use the immune system while it's still healthy. And that's before surgery, radiation, chemo. That's never been done before. So that is the idea. I make the first cancer treatment more uh, successful through the power of the immune system. Okay, that's very exciting. And you know, CellSci uh, has been working on the phase three trial now for several years and seems to be close to a readout. Can you talk about the trial design and what you're trying to show with it? It's the largest study ever done in head and neck cancer. Um, we are basically comparing the standard of care in head and neck, advanced primary head and neck cancer, that means stages three and four, not yet treated head and neck cancer, these people are just diagnosed. The standard of care in the NCCN guidelines is surgery, and then you do either radiotherapy or radiotherapy and cisplatin chemotherapy, which is so toxic people even die from it, it's horrible. Um, we are comparing, that is the comparison group, and the other group also gets the standard of care, but we're putting our drug first for three weeks. So really short time period, three weeks. No other cancer drug that we know of can show effects in three weeks, but we only get three weeks because if I delay your surgery, I may end up killing you. That's obviously not acceptable. So if we're right, there will be a new standard of care so multi-kind followed by surgery, radiation, chemo, and instead of a 50% chance of survival, you would have a 60 or 70% chance of survival. Okay, that's, that's a really big improvement. And since it's used in conjunction with standard of care, how, how does it actually affect the surgery and chemotherapy and radiotherapy that sure. are administered uh, after multi-kind? I mean, I think it has an effect on the tumor size. How, how, how might that actually help uh, the standard of care when, when it actually comes about? 
forget about tumor size. When it comes to comes to cancer immunotherapy, that's not a good indicator. The only thing that really matters when it matters is if you're alive or if you're dead. So we've had patients in our studies, about 10% of patients, as proven by pathology, have zero remaining cancer cells in the in the tumors that were taken out. By, shown by pathology. So that's obviously a very, very potent immune response against the tumor. But even in those patients, let's say their, their tongue was scheduled to be removed, even in those patients, in the study, you still have to take that tongue out because we're the unproven uh, therapy. So the questions you're raising can only be answered after the phase three has been concluded. We still have to do the same surgery same radiation, same chemotherapy. The focus for us is to increase your chance of living. Okay, that makes sense. And you, you named some of the outcomes that we saw, you know, where you actually don't have to uh, do some of those more serious surgeries uh, that, that are so debilitating. Um, what, what other outcomes besides that have you observed so far in the drugs and in multi-kind? <laughs> And we did multiple phase two studies, and then we used the exact same treatment regimen as we're using phase three. Remember, we can only treat for three weeks because we're not allowed to delay the surgery, so then comes the surgery. So we have all of the, the parts cut out, the tumors and surrounding tissues cut out, they go to pathology. 10% of patients had zero remaining cancer cells published in top-notch journals. The remaining 90% about 50% less cancer cells. I don't know how that cannot be beneficial for a patient. Patients could open their mouths again, they could move their tongues again, they could eat again, they gained weight. That's the opposite of head and neck cancer. Quality of life appeared to be improved. And we saw what we thought, now it recognized it's a smaller group, a 33% increase in overall survival. Hmm. So it's very, very positive. Yeah. Those are great numbers. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the safety profile, it sounds like from what you're saying, it, 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 that it's pretty good. What can you tell us about that? I mean, that's obviously the other half of the efficacy and safety uh, that the FDA looks at when they're approving a drug. The simplest way of letting you know the safety profile, profile must be good is FDA and the other regulators would never have let us put this into a patient who is in the intent to cure population if it was too toxic. Second reason you know that is because the, in the treatment that these patients get is radiation and chemo combined, which is so horrible, it kills people with toxicity. You can't possibly add any toxicity to that horrific radiation and chemotherapy toxicity without killing more people. So therefore, right then and there, you know that our product must be very benign. And then I tell you also from what we've seen, we just haven't seen any serious adverse events related to our product. Okay, that's, that's always a good sign. Uh, so looking at the, the other side of the, of the picture, the financial side, what kind of market size do you think you can access with Multikine in, in, this, in, in the head and neck uh, cancer indication? Well, it's, it's, it's huge. It's, this is a market that doesn't exist today. Today, the first treatment for these patients is surgery. There are 600, 650,000 people with head and neck cancer. Two thirds of it is advanced primary. That's 400,000 people. Obviously, you're never going to treat 400,000 people. If we're right and improve the current standard of care in the largest study ever done, which is what our study is, with overall survival as the endpoint, the gold standard for approval, we should become part of a new standard of care. And then we, instead of surgery, our drug should be the first treatment. So the numbers become obscene because it's every patient upon diagnosis before they've died, before they've been cured. So this should become a multi-billion dollar product, but it's really a revolution in the way we're thinking because why wouldn't you take the same concept from head and neck cancer to breast cancer, melanoma, cervical cancer, where we've already shown some very promising results. We showed that the drug killed human papillomavirus, the cause of the cancer. This is not an anti-cancer product. This is a product that removes the breaks from your immune system and allows your immune system to do what it's supposed to do while it's still strong. That's why we're giving it before surgery, radiation, and chemo. Yeah, that sounds like the most exciting part, that it's a platform for a much broader broader use than just in head and neck cancer. 
So that's that's very exciting. Uh, you know, the next question I wanted to ask was um, just about the population that Multikind serves. And you mentioned this earlier. Uh, there's the intent to cure and the intent to treat um, uh, different uh, groups. Now, how, how is Multikind different in that uh, intended population that you're targeting? Well, so the biggies in the field these days are Keytruda and Optiv, or checkpoint inhibitors, mm -hmm. right? And the, main, and the goal of many other companies is to try to add their product to help more people because these drugs only seem to work maybe in about one third of people and they're quite toxic. And But but still, they've shown wonderfully, uh, wonderful results, help, helped a lot of patients. They, however, must be given for a longer time period of months. And they're toxic. So... In our population, when you're, it's the intent to cure, the first treatment usually is surgery, I cannot delay your surgery to give a product for several months. So their products don't fit into the short three-week time frame. We're the only one who fits in there. Right. That's why we think we can establish ourselves to be the one drug in that population when they deal with all the metastatic patients, they deal with all of the patients after surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Yeah, I have to say that short uh, time period uh, and, and fast action of the drug is very impressive in, in that three-week time period, and you know, really, I think differentiates it from from a lot of other immunotherapies it's out there. Drug. It's your immune system. Yeah, we just you simply remove the brakes from your immune system. The tumor puts the brakes on. We remove the brakes with our drug. Your immune system does all of that. Your immune system is what kills the human papilloma virus. Our drug just helps the immune system do so. That's the key. Yeah, very, very exciting. And I uh, want to take a little look at history. Um, over the last decade, cell size hit some bumps in the road. Uh, one of them was your CRO, who seemed like they were slowing enrollment. Um, and then also the FDA put Multikine on clinical hold. And uh, I think you've worked through these at, at this point. Can, can you update us to where we are now on those two important things? Let me put it this way. <clears throat> We had a CRO that there was a, we sued them for their lack of enrollment and other things. We won the first ever case against a clinical research organization for material breach of contract. And uh, essentially that proves that they were responsible for the low enrollment. We got other people to enroll the study last patients were enrolled September 2016 we're just waiting for people to die it sounds horrible but we have to wait for them to die to show if the drug improves overall survival in my mind the FDA clinical hold is related to the horrible arbitration against that CRO uh, it's completely connected and all I can tell you is FDA did uh, the investigator had a report that showed no uh, GCP violations or issues that did not issue as a form 483 and the FDA lifted the clinical hold. So I don't know what happened on the background, but we got checked out. We came out completely clean and the study is now finally, should have been a five year study, ended up being a nine year study, is finally at the end. Great. Well, that, that brings us up to uh, upcoming milestones and what we should uh, be looking for in the near future. Yeah, let's let's look forward. I, I, by the way, I think all of these battles that you go through as a biotech company, George Rathman put it best. He says every biotech company has to go through the valley of death several times. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and that's normal. Everybody has it a little different. In the end, none of these things are ever remembered because all that people remember is that you are successful. I remember Celgene at seventy million dollars. I remember Amgen below its IPO price for six years. People don't remember that. Bottom line is they remember success. Within the next six, maybe nine months, somewhere around there, maybe sooner, maybe it's hard to tell. We, ex we need to wait for 298 people to die in the two main groups in our study. When we have that, then we will know what the survival benefit is. And do you have any sense on when that might be? It seems like it might be in the near term, just based on. It's on in the near problem. term because simply because the last patients were enrolled 25 months ago. Right. I uh, we have had patient enrollment starting in 2011. About half of these people, somewhere around there, will be dead in three years. So 
we, we must be pretty near to these numbers. We might even, maybe if we could argue, we should have already reached those numbers. I see. And I guess it's a blinded study, and that's why we don't have a little bit better understanding of kind of exactly where we are uh, in, the, in the trial. Is that but, correct? But, but, but the key is, it's very simple. If you have, and we've seen it before many, many times, if you have overall survival in a cancer drug, you're in a real minority because most cancer drugs are brought to market on really show no survival benefit. But if you have it, market loves you, doctors like you, patients like you, everybody likes you. If I have a lot of new friends suddenly, our point, I would, I, I think personally, I've put a lot of money into the company just this year again. I think the indications are will be successful, but I don't know either. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, we always have to wait until that uh, that readout for the uh, for the registrational trial, and we're we're eagerly looking forward to that. Um, Cellsci built a manufacturing facility. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, you spent about $100 million on developing not only the facility, but also the manufacturing process that you use for multi-kind. And uh, I guess that gives you complete control over all your biologics manufacturing, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, what can you tell us about the facility, and can it support production of all the product you need for multi-kind if you hit some of these global numbers uh, of, of treatments that we talked about earlier? Uh, absolutely. People don't understand why we built one for a product that wasn't proven yet. And it makes little sense, unless you know the regulations. A uh, biologic is controlled through its process of manufacturing. And if you don't have the same facility for your phase three studies as you have for sale, you raise all kinds of issues. There are plenty of companies that have successful phase threes but couldn't come to market because of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We want to avoid that. This is a full-scale manufacturing facility. We even have our own fill room. We fill it four degrees, which not many people can do. And uh, we have supplied this facility, the phase three study, and from this facility, and we'll be supplying the market. So we think that we've only built out one third of the facility. When fully built out, assuming $100,000 of treatment, you can probably sell, you can probably make four or five billion dollars worth of product in there. Okay, yeah, that sounds sufficient. And I guess, can it support any of the other uh, platforms that you have in your portfolio, such as Leaps? Or would that no, be a different a, type of that's process? A, that's a peptide. And the beauty of a peptide is there are lots and lots of people who will do it for you on a contract basis. You don't need to build your own facility. Okay, very good. But the problem with a peptide is they can also copy it more easily because everybody has the technology. For multi-kind, good luck trying to copy it. The manufacturing process is like our Coca-Cola formula. Exactly, exactly. It's, uh, it's the knowledge of the process itself that, uh, yes. that, that protects it from, from competition. Um, if Multicon is a success, and you know, as you said, we should find that out in the next, uh, next couple quarters, uh, what's next for CellSci? Where, where do you think you'll go next? I always love that question because it actually suggests that I have control. Okay? Uh, and you know, oh, oh boy, the reality is if you look at companies of our size when they suddenly are successful, the stocks always end up in the multi-billion dollar range. Mm -hmm. And for example, I heard that Imclone, remember the Martha Stewart company? I sure did. Supposedly 156 buyout offers in the next six months after the data came out. So just like when you're 60, you make a lot of money, you have a lot of new friends. Uh, if you're successful, uh, with a drug, everybody wants to be partnering with you, everybody wants to buy you out. You look at it. Yesterday a deal was done by Endosite, and the, 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 the writers talked about it. They called the $2.1 billion a snap-on deal. They say anything between 2 and $5 billion these days is a snap-on deal. Snap-on to a tool is, you know, it's a chest, it's 2 to $5 billion, it's nothing for these big guys. Well, no, noting that you your uh, company is trading at about $100 million in market cap right now, that's that's a pretty big uh, payoff for uh, investors right now. That's why I bought a lot more stock this summer. <laughs> it yeah. makes sense to me. So we've seen a lot of immuno-oncology deals take place in recent quarters. Celgene bought Juno for $9 billion, and they also bought Impact Biosciences for what $1.1 billion up front, and also some BioBucks after that. And then there was the Insight deal for Macrogenics Checkpoint Inhibitor for $900 million, and this was a Phase one asset. So what does this suggest for a product like Multikine that's near the end of a Phase three trial and also has the potential to address the intent to cure population? Let's be realistic. Once when a new kid comes into school, everybody's excited. 
when a new company comes out. Oh, we cured cancer in mice, we're going to cure cancer in people. Everybody is excited. Three years later, even though the company knows more about its technology, the level of excitement goes down. Five years after that, it's even lower. We're at a point, we've been around so long, this phase three has taken so long that we've, we've become that potted plant that sits in your office for 10 years, you don't even see it anymore. That's the opportunity, because in the end, the only thing that matters is the data. If you actually increase overall survival, you will get to market. It's that simple. And the, under the current FDA, who is more pragmatic than the old FDA, I think you have an even better chance of coming to market. Right. Well, I just want to remind uh, viewers that uh, we're talking to Celtai today um, and CEO Geert Kirsten. Uh, ticker symbol for the company is CVM. And uh, Geert, any uh, last thoughts that you want to leave us with before we sign off for the day? Uh, it, it's, it's a completely, biotech is a completely illogical business. We should not be successful. All of the success should come from big pharma companies. They have the money, they have beautiful labs, full of smart people, and they're not producing. We, we never have enough money, we're always worried, but somehow under these circumstances, we produce. So we're not the first company who's gotten beaten up and made a great recovery. So I think we're going to be successful. It's that simple. All right. Well, thank you so much, Garrett. Uh, very exciting story, and uh, I'm interested to see how, how it all turns out. Thank you again.